Hello, everyone. Today on The Final Bar, we're joined by Katie Stockton from Fairlead Strategies, joining us from uh, Connecticut to help uh, add some, uh, some clarity, hopefully, to what's going on here. I was all mentally prepared for a big distribution day uh, with, uh, with the movements out of the open, the S&P going into negative territory, but huge appreciation into the close of the S&P finishing 3035. So an interesting change of character, potentially, as we go on. Ladies and gentlemen, this is The Final Bar. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to The Final Bar. I'm your host, Dave Keller. I'm the Chief Market Strategist here at StockCharts.com. In Redmond, Washington, thanks so much for joining us every weekday after the close for our show. Try to connect the short-term movements of today with the long-term trends. And again, with such a fascinating turn of events, uh, just before lunchtime uh, Eastern, a huge rally into the close. The characteristics evolving a bit, but still technology at the lower end of the range, along with healthcare, comm services, Financials leading the way higher. So some interesting themes to pick out. I did want to say uh, happy afternoon from the home of the award-winning Stock Charts TV. Very excited to share with all of you. We submitted uh, one of our documentaries we did earlier this year, uh, 50 Years on Wall Street, profiling the, the life and, and career of Ralph Acampora uh, to the Telly Awards. And we're silver and bronze winners in a number of different categories. We'll be sharing some information out on social media, but Congrats to our producer, Gretchen Pitluck, and the Stock Charts TV team. Really, really good work and, uh, and a lot more good content to come for all of you. Uh, in terms of upcoming events on Stock Charts TV and, uh, and on the final bar, I wanted to share with you some of the great guests we have. As I mentioned, we have Katie Stockton joining us today. Uh, fantastic analyst I've known for a number of years. Excited to get her take on where we're at. Tomorrow, we have Ryan Dietrich from uh, LPL Financial, another uh, solid analyst uh, as well. Next week, we have Peter Brandt on June 2nd. On Tuesday, on Wednesday, we have Frank Capillary uh, from Instanet. So I feel like we're bringing out the, the, the big guns here. We're bringing out top strategists to help us make sense of this environment. No better time with all the volatility, all the uncertainty. Also, I mentioned our, our documentary with Ralph Akinpora. Our next episode of Behind the Charts is coming up this Monday on June 1st. And it's actually going to include a um, focus on our conversation with Ralph Akinpora talking about some of his lessons learned as a, as a uh, technical analyst, learning the practice in the 60s, 70s, 80s. Um, so that interview will be shared with you on Monday, our next episode of Behind the Charts. So check that out as well. So as we get to a market recap, and, and again, I've, I've told uh, my, my daughter was asking me about my show uh, last night during dinner, and I told her it is one of the most interesting things I've ever attempted to do is, is host a closing bell show in this environment because things are changing so rapidly going into the close. And we've had these big runs, these big changes of character, I feel like. Yesterday, we had you know, a market that was holding up very well, and then it sold off, distributed really solidly into the close. Today, we have the opposite, gapped higher. We went back below 3,000, all of a sudden felt like this big distribution day, but during the day, reversed back higher and then really accelerated into the close. So certainly better buying coming in, uh, going into the close. Small caps, mid caps up significantly with the S&P finishing up uh, 1.5%. That puts the S&P at 30, 36. And we've talked about that S&P 3,000 level, the 200-day moving average, all of these key uh, sort of lines in the sand, this key resistance area. We're going to look at the daily chart in a second and, uh, and see how this has changed things a little bit, but overall still, you know, threatening to break above. And the question is always is what's the follow through? What does the next day bring? Do we get the follow through tomorrow? The NASDAQ 100 was certainly in the red for a little while. It finished back in, in positive territory with a nice run uh, going into the close, but, but spent most of the day in the negative territory. Uh, but the NASDAQ 100 finishing up just over half a percent. This pushes the VIX down below 30. Again, we're now at 27.60. Looking at some other markets very quickly, and then we'll look at some of the charts together. Bonds uh, actually came off going into the, uh, the close last hour or two, really uh, more distributive. And so the TLT finished down a little bit below zero, not too much, down to 163. That pushes the 10-year yields uh, um, steady around uh, 68 basis points. Gold actually finishing positive. <clears throat> that was a, a run out of the, uh, the open. We actually uh, gapped down at the open, but finished back up 
pretty much in yesterday's range. So sort of a non-change for, for that, but the rest of the commodity complex uh, certainly finishing more, uh, more on the weaker side. Let's look at a daily chart of the S&P and then we'll get to some of the other sector and stock themes. So, you know, yesterday we opened uh, above the 200 day, we traded above the 200 day, we closed back below it and back below that crucial 3000 level. I think the question for, for me and many others is now we are at the upper end of this resistance range. Do we have the staying power, the momentum to propel through that upper end? And it didn't feel like it yesterday. Yesterday was not the big follow through day you might be expecting. I have to argue today we probably saw the, the breakthrough you might have expected. Earlier in the day, it certainly felt like a continuation of that distribution. We were trading below yesterday's range. It was a, uh, you know, a bearish pattern, opening higher, closing lower, felt like more uh, weight, but certainly buyers came in through the bulk of the day, pushed the S&P higher to close at 3036. So this is now well above the resistance range. I have to say, if you've not bought into the concept that the short term, medium term trends, both positive, I certainly think you have to you have to see that by now. Um, you know, as I mentioned uh, on Friday, the medium term trend following indicator that I used just turned positive on Friday, finally recognizing the staying power of this uptrend. And we've seen the follow through the RSI now above 60 for the first time since uh, back here at the market top in February. So, so certainly it, it, it's felt more like a, 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 an uptrend of sorts. The interesting concern as we get to the, look at the, at the sectors is the sector confirmation. So you still have this lagging uh, with the NASDAQ 100, with uh, technology sort of at the lower end of the range, finishing in the positive, which is encouraging, but still lagging behind the overall market. So the question is, can the market have an extended rally with a rotation of leadership into financials and industrials and real estate, which is not what I would normally assume to be the leadership areas, but uh, certainly seems to be where we've, uh, where we've seen the movements uh, in the last couple of days, certainly this week. So today, the XLF finishing up another uh, a strong positive day, up 4% in our um, mailbag segment a little later. We'll look into example with Goldman Sachs or Bank of America, I forget which stock I, I picked, but looking at how they've gapped above some of their moving averages just uh, this week. Industrials number two up over 3% and REITs finishing 2%. Consumer discretionary fourth on the list, uh, you know, with a pretty, pretty decent day uh, outperforming by a little bit as well. On the bottom side, we had technology, communication services, healthcare. So again, a rotation on a relative basis away from some of these areas that have been leadership for a long time, rotating more towards financials and, uh, and other areas of the market. In terms of industry groups and some of the rotations we saw within financials, you saw banks up 6.7%. I think Bank of America is the chart we're going to look at a little uh, little later. Other industry groups in the top 10, mortgage finance, the top group, uh, up over 2%, uh, 10%. Uh, within consumer discretionary, you had a, a couple groups as well, including home construction, which includes the, uh, the major home builders. Defense within industrial. So industrials, again, have been written off by so many investors. Aerospace, defense, airlines, all struggling, but you see how they've uh, rotated higher very, very quickly and really showing uh, signs of improvement this week. And, and again, being in Seattle, we look a lot at uh, Boeing and what the potential is. And, and interesting to see uh, stocks like that all, all of a sudden starting to, uh, to rotate, uh, rotate higher. On the downside, you had a handful of groups finishing uh, to the negative side. Internet stocks within communication services, one of the few groups in the, in the red, and that's uh, within communication services, down half a percent. Gold miners and mining stocks down as well. So Newmont Mining had been a consistent uh, name at the top of the list. And again, it, it was hard to be really positive about the long-term prospects of the market when Newmont Mining is one of the top performers. That's starting to change though. I don't know if it's still, yeah, it's still in the top 10, but it's coming off a little bit. This is the number one stock maybe a week or two ago, and that was slowly rotating lower. Also worth noting pharmaceuticals at the lower end of there. And so in Within healthcare, we've had some rotation away from some of those uh, some of those key groups. I want to focus just a little bit on some of the uh, individual charts in our uh, Mindful Investor Live chart list, just to see how some of these things have changed. Uh, you know, here we're looking at the um, breadth lines, looking at the cumulative advanced decline lines for the S and P, for mid cap stocks, for small cap stocks, and look how quickly this picture has rotated. Right, we talked about. The uptrend coming out of the March lows, you can see the pattern of higher highs and higher lows. I'm looking at the mid cap uh, metric here. You can see how they all sort of broke below trend line support pretty much across the board here a couple weeks ago. This is when the market pulled off, sold off a little bit. All of a sudden it felt like a lower high, a breakdown of support, but look at how we've now rotated back higher. Small caps, mid caps now making a new swing high. 
New York Stock Exchange just uh, today to yesterday started doing it. The S&P, this isn't updated for today's close, but I'm fairly 100% certain, if not 99% certain, we'll get a new swing high for the S&P breadth as well. So these all now rotating more back to the positive side. So we've talked a while about this bear market rally and how we have this huge resistance area. And I've been very confident that that is a, a area to pay attention to. I'm now feeling more and more confident that these short-term breaks that we're seeing in, in terms of swings to the upside certainly clear the way for, um, for, for their upside. And for me, now it's a question of just what's where the leadership is coming from. Is it, are we going to see technology shares participating a little more in this uh, uptrend these last couple of days? It's been without tech, without, uh, without healthcare for the most part. This is an interesting chart. So this is looking at the percent of stocks in the S&P and the percent of stocks uh, above their 200-day and then the percent of stocks in the S&P above their 50-day moving averages. And again, not all these breadth indicators are updated through the close today, but you know, going midweek here, we have over a third of S&P stocks above their 200-day. As we know, the S&P just breaking above its 200-day in the last week. So more and more stocks actually able to do that, but still less than half. But if you look, look at this, within about a month, maybe four weeks from the lows, we had literally 0% of the S&P above their 50-day simple moving averages, now 90%, 9 out of 10 above their 50 days. So it, it is very similar to sort of that big, the, the breadth thrust, if you will, coming out of the lows in 2019, where you set a similar situation, 0% above the 50-day, a huge acceleration over 90%. That was here. This is the you are here phase. We had a little bit of a pullback soon after, but after that, you know, obviously the beginning of much further, uh, further upside. So some of these breadth measures that have been, I think, questioning the, um, the constitution of this uptrend certainly seeming to uh, more and more start to validate that we're in a short-term uptrend for sure. That's our market recap for today. And again, a lot of movement in the last uh, couple of days, a lot of themes to dig in deeper. I hope you can take some time going through some of the charts on your own and, and try to fill in some of the blanks. Uh, with your uh, with your own analysis. We're going to take a quick commercial break. Back with my guest, Katie Stockton from Fairlead Strategies. We'll see you in a minute. Hey everyone, welcome back to the show, The Final Bar. I'm your host, Dave Keller here at stockcharts.com. As a reminder, we love to answer your questions at a time like this where there's volatility, there's uncertainty, there's a lot of movement. Uh, we're certainly here to help answer your questions, help you navigate things. Just shoot us an email, thefinalbar at stockcharts.com. A little later today in this, uh, in this show, we're gonna feature some questions from the Final Bar mailbag that we've received in the last day or two. We'll do another segment on Friday, so keep the questions coming. We'd love to answer your questions on the air uh, later in the week. I want to welcome on my guest, uh, Katie Stockton from Fairlead Strategies. I've followed Katie's work and have known her for a number of years and, uh, and have always valued what she's seen. Katie, welcome back to the show. Thanks so much for having me, Dave. So as, we, as you, you heard earlier, I mean, we, we have this situation. We talked about this you know, huge resistance around 3,000, the 200-day moving average, all of that. You started with a longer-term chart of the S&P. What is your toolkit telling you about the, the, current, uh, the current market here? Well, you know, the, the environment has really forced us to become very short to intermediate term in our focus. So we're all caught up in these, you know, minor levels, which, uh, you know, including the 200-day moving average, which really hasn't been a major hurdle um, in either direction for the S&P 500. I think it's good to contextualize the volatility that we have seen from a long-term perspective using the monthly bar chart. And that's what you see here with the cloud model. The cloud model is, as you know, a trend following gauge. And it does suggest that the market still is technically in a long-term uptrend. So with the, the downdraft that we saw in February, March, there was actually a successful test of long-term support that resided right around 2350. That was based on the December 2018 low, the bottom boundary of the cloud, and then also a Fibonacci retracement level is right there. So it was a very important threefold support. What we've seen since then is an upturn in the monthly stochastics in the bottom window there. And what that suggests is that short to intermediate term momentum has improved enough to support follow through. 
and we have resistance, of course, at February's high. So that really defines the upper boundary of what could be a long-term trading range, but the cloud model would suggest that indeed new highs are ultimately likely for the S&P 500, albeit not a near-term uh, situation. This is such a helpful chart because I, I, I hear exactly what you're saying. There's such a short termism. It's so tempting with how things are fluctuating day to day. And, and even, you know, just the movements going into the close ends up moving very quickly. Having a proper long term perspective makes a ton of sense to me. This is great. Chart number two, you were, uh, we were talking about uh, sentiment this is looking at the AAII rankings. How does this relate to the long term picture we just looked at? I think, again, in this environment, it's all about uh, behavioral elements and sentiment. Um, you really can't justify any of the moves that we've seen, especially the intraday swings using fundamental or macro analysis. It, it, it makes us rely on the charts even more and also the behavioral elements of the market. So we have ways of trying to understand market sentiment, and this just happens to be one of them. It's the spread between, uh, it's the American Association of Individual Investors. So AAII. It's a spread between their bullish and bearish readings. And what we've found is that it's still very, very oversold. If you were to look at the, this as an oscillator, you can see it's coming off of its lows. Previous lows have been associated with very important lows for the major indices. You can see August 2019, for one example, December 2018. And prior to that, we're getting back in, into the 2016 lows. So it's very rare to see sentiment as bearish as it has been. And I think some folks would find it somewhat surprising that it isn't farther off of its lows. And what this creates is an environment that has the potential to, I guess, be characterized by that fear of missing out, right? So for people that see the breakouts that are underway on a short-term basis and say, gosh, I don't want to miss this up move, you know, noticing that the next resistance is really back at the highs. And when sentiment is as such, it does create that fear of missing out. It's a great chart. An interesting read on the sentiment there, Katie. And then the last chart, we were, uh, you know, financials obviously leading the way this week so far with some big moves in the major banks and, and really across the board within financials. Give us a read on the, on the tenure on interest rates. What, what are you seeing here? Well, it's been really interesting to watch the tenure treasury yields flirt with their 50-day moving average. You don't see that on this chart. You see the 10-week moving average, which is really a, sort of a rough estimate of that 50-day. But we, what we definitely have seen is a shift in intermediate term momentum. You can see that in the MACD indicator in the bottom window. It's moving average base gauge, as you all know. And that has a crossover that reflects significant improvement, if you want to call it that, in momentum and suggests that ultimately we'll see that 50-day moving average cleared. And already you're seeing that sentiment shift behind the banks is one example of, of stocks that are attuned to these yields. So I, th I think it's a meaningful shift. It doesn't mean by any stretch that that downtrend that's been in place for almost two years now is being reversed. There's plenty of resistance between here and even the 200 day moving average, the first level being around 1%. But you can imagine 1% would likely be sort of a market positive in the near term. Now, if I could ask you one question, Katie. So we have this situation, right? And, and I know we, we, we have this great long-term chart of the S&P. Thinking more tactically for a little bit, you have this situation with the S&P now, you know, continuing this uptrend, but all of a sudden technology starting to lag behind a little bit. If mm -hmm. you do buy into the, you know, S&P returning to 3,400, where would you be looking right now? What's a, what, is there a tactical opportunity? Would you be focusing on things like financials that are you know, sort of leading the way this week, or is it sticking with some of the technology healthcare groups that have done so well up until now? I mean, it's a really relevant question, as you know, because you're seeing the sector dispersions change a lot. And I, I think it's really a function, and this is what we're telling our subscribers, of the value to growth um, trades, or growth mm -hmm. to value, I should say. So rotation out of growthy stocks into value stocks. And I think that's a function of investors trying to seek out opportunities in areas that are relatively oversold, which also happen in some cases to have sensitivity to kind of, you know, in interest rates and treasury yields and um, the macro environment. So you're seeing some cyclical rotation. And that's where I'm focusing in terms of my new long recommendations are in those areas, but I'm keeping a short to intermediate term time frame on those positions, noting that many still have very weak long-term momentum profiles. Katie, this is a fantastic Kate, uh, take, and thank you so much for joining the show. Hope you and the family stay safe in uh, Connecticut, and we'll have you again on, uh, on real soon, all right? Thank you.
Thanks so much. That's Katie Stockton from Fairlead Strategies. And again, I hope if you took one thing away from there, there's so many great nuggets within that. But her first chart, if you remember, we get so caught up in the short term fluctuations, you know, especially on a closing bell show, just trying to hit on these themes. Her monthly chart really tells uh, a great story. And, and it's a great reminder to stay long term oriented, especially if that's your investment horizon. So really good, uh, really good thoughts all around. We're going to go to our next segment, the uh, Final Bar Mailbag. And again, you can shoot questions to us anytime via email, the final bar at stockcharts.com. These are all questions that have come for you in the, la uh, in the last day or two, and we're getting some great questions, so keep them coming. Question number one, um, David, I enjoy your show and glad that you joined Stock Charts. You know what? I do as well. Thank you so much. Very glad. Um, scanning down here. Oh, yeah. I was discussing the bullish case for the market. Failed to mention that the volume was awful. Um, looking at sectors and also the advanced decline lines uh, from a higher lows, right, right, right. The, the tops have had lower highs. Sorry, I'm scanning very quickly. I just want to show you. So, you know, uh, so two parts to your question. Number one, you know, what about the weak volume on the rally? And I think that's totally fine. I was actually having a, a healthy discussion with my colleague, Julius DeKempner, about this uh, end of last week. And, and as you probably know, if you watch the show for a while, I don't look at volume a ton. And that's on purpose. I, I, I feel like volume was a part of the toolkit when I learned it 20 some years ago. Um, but as time has gone on, I found volume to be less and less rele relevant to my approach for a lot of reasons. Although some people I follow and, and respect a great deal will certainly incorporate volume. So for me, I pay less attention to the volume on the trends. But if you would, you could certainly see absolutely lighter volume across the board. And that traditionally would suggest weaker upside momentum when you have an uptrend with lighter volume. Totally fair. Just not a central part of how I, how I think of things. The fact that you've seen the market go higher with a, if they roll over and advance decline lines, I think that's absolutely right. Uh, and if you look at the, at the daily advanced decline lines, you've seen that, that same sort of thing. What, what is interesting to me though, um, I guess uh, in response to that is now I think you're starting to see these breadth measures turn higher. And while that has been a, you know, a, a questionable part of this last little bit and you saw a stabilization in, in uh, the S&P, you saw a downturn in breadth. Now all of a sudden you're starting to see these breadth measures turn higher. And I think that confirms short-term, medium-term trends are, are actually more positive than certainly I would have expected them uh, to be by now. And again, Volume, advanced decline lines, for me, all of that is secondary to price. And if the price keeps making higher highs and higher lows, you want to own that chart. And, and that's what I'm seeing with stocks overall. It's a really good question, though. Thank you for that. Question number two, a very bullish breadth thrust. I actually took a screenshot of this. And thanks for including a visual aid on here. You're basically saying, what's up with the difference in breadth? At the top panel, this is the S&P and the percent of stocks above their 50-day. This is what I usually use. And as you saw in my chart earlier, it's actually up to 90 now I, um, uh, since uh, we took the screenshot. If you look at the bottom one, though, you can see that only 60% of the S&P above their 50-day exponential moving average. How can there be this huge discrepancy between how much are up above their uh, simple moving average and how much are above their 50-day exponential moving average a chart of Bank of America is probably a really good example of how to demonstrate that. So in blue, you have the 50-day simple moving average. This is what I've had on my charts for years, and many of you probably do as well. In red, we have the 50-day exponential moving averages, and it gets to the calculation of those two. When a stock rallies, just because this is a simple average on, in blue of the last 50 days, it tends to be a little less sensitive. So when the, when the trend changes, it'll take a little bit longer for, that, uh, for the, the trajectory to change. And so it's easier more often than not, uh, in this case, at least in terms of how it came off of the lows, it was easier for the Bank of America and a lot of uh, financial stocks, for example, to get above their 50-day simple moving averages. It took a little bit more to get above the exponential moving average, that's because of the big rally and then sort of the choppy sideways action that you had in a lot of uh, in a lot of stocks. So if a stock is right in there, that would sort of satisfy question number one, but not question number two. It would say, yes, it's above its simple moving average, but not above its exponential average. I think what you're going to see with both of these is them turn higher as stocks like B, &A, B of A, Goldman Sachs, and, and other sectors as well, accomplishing both of those and, and getting up there. So it's just a, the nature of how stocks traded coming off of the lows, that big spike, and then the choppy move. It makes the exponential moving averages actually sort of taper off a little bit more, while the simple moving average is still going to come down just because of the way that they're calculated. It's a really good question there. Next question, would I interpret growth versus value chart? And I put a shot here as a head and shoulders. Is that a significant development? That's a really good question. I think you're talking about this 
the peaks surrounded by two lower peaks. So listen, you know, head and shoulders patterns, if you read like the John Murphy, Martin Pring, uh, especially Edwards and McGee, that's the classic text on chart patterns written in the early 1900s. It's a, it's a really cool read if you've never done it. Just a beautiful discussion about stock picking using charts. But anyways, um, they talk about uh, head and shoulders patterns. They really need to be longer term. They're not designed to be like a one month pattern. It's designed to be like three to six months or so is a, is a true head and shoulders pattern. And on a ratio chart, I'm not sure I buy into the fact of this being a head and shoulders pattern. What I do buy into it is that it's a lower high. And if you hear, I always talk about lower highs, lower lows, higher highs, higher lows, because I'm looking at that. If you think about it, a lower high and a lower low will basically be the same as a head and shoulders top. I just wouldn't call it that and use all the measurements and everything that I think head and shoulders patterns uh, have involved. I think the fact that it, it had a lower high and now made it a lower swing low and is now by definition in a downtrend, I think that does have meaning. And just like Katie Stockton was mentioning earlier, this potential rotation into value names from growth is a huge theme uh, that you certainly want to be, uh, want to be uh, paying attention to if you haven't already. One more quick question. Uh, I've been listening to your videos for a few months now. I noticed you often word, use the word distribution. Are you talking generally about selling or do you mean selling is more likely uh, institutions selling to the retail crowd? Um, that is a really, really good question. And so for me, words like accumulation and distribution, for me, it's a reminder that the price is not just price. It means something about the uh, supply and demand picture happening with a bunch of investors and their collective psychology. So if there is more demand than supply, by definition, the price is going to go higher. If more investors want to own Bank of America, they will push the price higher, and that's the price going higher. If there is an influx of supply because of selling, if there is a uh, re re um, lessening of demand, the price is going to go down. And so you think of it as a big institution accumulating in an uptrend, distributing in a downtrend. I don't think of it in terms of institutions versus retail, because the only thing that's really going to cause this sort of significant move is if the big institutions are participating in that is sort of the way I think of it. So I'm in general thinking of institutional accumulation and distribution. And for me, it's a shorthand looking at uptrends and downtrends. For me, it's just a reminder that that's what's causing uh, the pattern. So really good question. I, I appreciate it very much. That's our mailbag for today. Those are all really, really good questions. And a number of you are, are, are incorporating charts into your questions and it's super helpful. I'd love to help you guys uh, navigate these markets, answer your questions, and so uh, shoot them to us anytime. We need to wrap the show, folks, and go to the three and three, three charts in three minutes. And we'll start with gold, the GLD. So, you know, as we're looking at stocks, as we're looking at this leadership rotation, as we're looking at, um, you know, all these relative movements and the breadth and the sentiment, as a reminder, when you're thinking about asset allocation, you know, uh, you know thinking about bonds, thinking about commodities, thinking about equities, you know, it's worth noting that gold's still in a primary uptrend, still making higher highs and higher lows. It's pulled back, and I think that's why it's really important to see what happens here. Finished up on the day. So actually, earlier in the day, it looked a little, little weaker, and now it's rallied up to close above yesterday to finish positive, still above upward sloping moving averages that I like. The relative strength on gold is what concerns me the most. And again, even though the primary trend's still positive, equities are just getting it done way more on a relative basis. And so I think when you think about allocating between the two of them, having some portion in a chart going up and to the right, I would never feel that bad about it, but be wary of the relative strength and how equity is certainly outperforming uh, in recent weeks. Chart number two is looking at uh, the S&P 500. And here we talked about breadth and looking at the percent of stocks above their 200 day and above their 50 day. And I just, it's so incredible to me to see how in six weeks, this is actually a little longer. So there's about two months you'd have from the lows in March, 0% of the S&P above their 50-day, now 90 plus percent uh, above their 50-day, over a third above the 200-day. And you can see how this has broken out recently. So just like the price is broken above its swing highs, you have the same thing in this breadth reading. Again, for me thinking, what would make me feel 100% this is an uptrend, long-term trend positive? I think you're looking at previous highs and I think you're looking at the S&P with over 50% above their 200-day moving averages. We're not there yet but every day seems to be bringing us a little closer to it. And then finally, the last chart is looking at the cumulative advanced decline lines. And I've color coded these amber, sort of a neutral color. If today was Friday, I'd probably color code those back to green because I think we've had a break above uh, trend line resistance. We're making a new swing high pretty much across the board. And I think when today's close gets locked in, I think we'll see the S&P popping up a little bit higher as well. So the breadth picture really improving you know, in a way that certainly validates the breakthrough above the 200-day. The I think for now, can that hold the support going through the rest of the week? 
I want to thank you for joining us every weekday for the final bar. Thanks to my guest, Katie Stockton from Fairlead Strategies. For StockCharts.com in Redmond, Washington, I'm Dave Keller. Be safe. Have a great night. Hey guys, Grayson Rose here with StockCharts.com. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. Remember, if you did, give us a like down below, leave us a comment, we'd love to hear from you. And most importantly, don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel for daily content from an incredible collection of technical analysts and financial minds. We'll see you back here very soon. Happy charting, my friends.